And it actually made me think of Proverbs 25 too, which says that it's the glory of God to conceal a thing and the glory of kings to seek it out. And I thought we could reformulate it and say it's the glory of writers to conceal a thing and the glory of readers to seek it out. And furthermore, I as a reader don't only want to seek those concealments out. I also want to experience and observe how it was concealed. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today, I want to talk a little bit about the reading life, facets of literature and reading books and why we do it. To help guide my conversation, I'm going to bring in Living by Fiction by Annie Dillard. I've had this book for quite a while now, at least five years. I first came to love Annie Dillard through her very slim volume called Holy the Firm. I actually have a very early video on this channel about that very text. Then I would go on to read some of her other well-known works, such as the collection Teaching a Stone to Talk, and also The Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Fun fact, she went to UVA at the same time that Alexander Theroux went to UVA, and one night they danced together. The next day she would call him basically charming. So even though this is a work of literary criticism or adapting some of what she says on her first page, philosophizing in a teacup, it nonetheless has this sharp, bold, trenchant voice coupled with the allure and wit that we have come to know of Annie Dillard. In her book about the writing life, she famously said, write as if you were dying. Well, as a reader, more than a writer, I like to change that around and challenge myself to read as if I were dying. This text is about 180 pages or so, and it has more of the free-ranging dialectical mode. This doesn't have that pithy, tidy concision of a self-help book. It has more of a nuanced investigation of objects that we're dredging up from underwater and taking out onto the shore and cleaning off very carefully with archaeologist tools. So I challenge you to stick with it because she will often make points that lead up to another point that seems to totally knock the legs out from the first point or just make infuriating remarks that seem so myopic but I challenge you to stick it out for the entire text because you'll see that the text as a totality, the total 180 pages, you can't just pick a thread and pull it and it stand on its own. It has to stay knit together as one fabric. She also covers an amazing amount of ground. Can literature tell us anything about the universe? Can we actually say that we can know something. So she gets into the epistemological arguments of literature and reading. Can we really come to know what the author actually meant? Is the author actually recreating a world or just offering their interpretation, in which case we're even farther removed because ours is an interpretation of an interpretation? Does literature matter? Does art matter? I like how she also constantly extends her arguments to encapsulate the arts as a whole, bringing in painting and music. She breaks it into three sections. In the first section, she surveys and schematizes what she calls contemporary modernist literature. And she talks about how she chose that clumsy epithet over postmodernism, although she does admit that postmodernism is probably the best word for it. What she calls Modernist writing is what we call the modernists. So this is Wolf and Nabokov and Proust and Joyce and Beckett. And who she means by contemporary modernists are going to be what we sometimes call the black humorists, John Barth, John Hawkes, William Gass. And furthermore, she also splits in terms of prose style into two schools, the contemporary modernists into plain prose and fancy prose. She talks about surfaces or surface art, 
where the language is meant to dazzle and the structure of the art is meant to be seen. It points to itself. And so in the second section, she will compare and contrast those two different styles of contemporary modernism, the fancy prose and the plain prose. And then in the third section, she asks the question, can literary criticism really interpret art's meaning? And furthermore, is there a meaning there to interpret? Her method of approach is what could easily be called wordy or loquacious by readers who take themselves more seriously than books and writers. But if you stick with it, you'll see that it's not wordy. It's necessary because it's properly nuanced. As she stresses over and over, when we talk about literature, there are so many overlaps. The borders just aren't that clear. But her approach is to present two extremes and then work her way towards that Aristotelian golden mean. Fiction writers are, I hope to show, thoughtful interpreters of the world. But instead of producing interpretations, instead of doing research or criticism, they doodle on the walls of the cave. They make art objects which must themselves be interpreted. At one point, she says, any art, including an art of surface, must do more than dazzle. And this was one of the first things that provoked me, and I wrote in the margin, must it? Because I find that I'm drawn to books where the aesthetics of the way language and even syntax is used dazzles me, and I find that that's enough. Though, of course, if there's serious meaning to be had, that's a strong bonus. But instead of chucking the book aside, I open myself up. Whenever I feel myself becoming defensive when I read works like this, I take a moment to open back up to open the channel of communication. As she moves into her epistemological considerations, she says, science as a whole, like philosophy, wants to proceed from a firm base. Interestingly, the human effort to locate that base, to set knowledge firmly upon the plinth of perception, I love that, seems repeatedly to result in everybody's sinking at once. At any rate, I think the interest in cognition derives ultimately from a genuine interest in the world for its own sake. And by that, she means something akin to platonic forms, knowing the thing in itself, the ding on sick. And I imagine that Western thought intended simply to get this little business out of the way so it could proceed with its task of tracing quarks or analyzing texts. But no one has been able to get it out of the way. Instead, it just gets more interesting in its own right. In one of her few statements of pith, she says the mind is itself an art object. And she's talking about now in contemporary modernism. And I immediately thought of two things. One was La Medusa by Vanessa Place, where she takes this concept of the mind itself being an art object to its logical postmodern extreme. I also thought about how Paul, in his epistles, at one point, he refers to us as God's handiwork or God's workmanship or God's craft. The actual Greek word that's used is poema. In other words, we are God's poems. Language itself is a selection and abstraction from a knowable flux. The world shades into gradations too fine for speech. That right there, if you caught it, really shows that this is Annie Dillard writing this. She is, after all, a fantastic writer. And I love how she's using this notion of a Lucretian model of flux and change brought about by significant swerves. As you move towards the middle and latter portions of the book, you will start to see where there are multi-tiered arguments. And I've drawn arrows on my pages to kind of connect the main points. So again, you really have to read this all the way through instead of stopping with one thing that stands out and extrapolating your own conclusions from there. Because she often surprised me with where she ended up. It's almost like she provokes in such a way to grab your attention and then bring you along on the journey, only to then, when she has you firmly in her grip, bring the enlightenment. And this makes so much sense, because Dillard is not only a writer, but she's a very gifted observer 
of nature and human beings. And she is, in the end, a wonderful teacher. Fiction cannot escape the world as its necessary subject matter. Stein's work, meaning Gertrude Stein, and Finnegan's Wake come close to vaporizing the world and making of language a genuine stuff. But, skipping down, Stein's writing brought forth no revolution. Neither did Finnegan's Wake. Whoa! Yeah, if you're like me, you'll be like, whoa, whoa, what are you talking about? Stick with it. Literature co-opted them. They joined the canon with scarcely a ripple and inspired few successors. If fiction's materials had really been merely words, and if writers had succeeded in detaching the words from their reference, then it would have been a revolution. But fiction's materials are bits of the world. Mere change is not revolution. The contemporary modernists are here, all right, but they did not slay the old guard in their beds. Instead, the old guard liked their looks, invited them in, and exchanged a few tricks with them after dinner. Fiction has expanded its borders. Nothing has been killed or replaced anything. The old co-opted the new. Everywhere, categories overlap. Even if we name names, we get into trouble. She does go to the place where you're probably thinking she needs to go when she talks about how literature is just this sort of natural vacuum or a, a type of nature that abhors a vacuum, maybe. <laughs> so anything new that comes along gets sucked up into it. I would be the last to argue that fiction's wide audience keeps it responsible. Anyone could far more easily argue that it keeps it mediocre and stunted. This is how I would formulate it when it comes to the whole argument about aesthetic over content or surface over depth, the dazzlement of the writing and the pyrotechnics of language versus the plot, 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 character, 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 pace, 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 narrative, narrative, narrative of story. This is how I see it. Obviously, I want both. And there's plenty of work out there that does both very well. You don't have to have both, though. But here's my rule of thumb. If you don't have anything really to say or any amazing story to tell, then at least say it very well. If you do have something to say or you do have a great story and you don't know how to say it very well, then what you do have to say had better be really good. And then we move into criticism. And this is where I found the meat from this book in terms of thinking about myself as a reader and thinking about why we read. Criticism must always try to know a text on its own terms, but it will always fail. Criticism cannot know its object. There is no guaranteed thread of connection between any interpretation and any text. So criticism is a particularly fanciful and Baroque form of skywriting. <laughs> this is just amazing rhetorical abilities here. And that put me in the mind of something that Rilke said in one of his letters to the young poet. And he talked about how nothing can damage art or do more harm to art than criticism. Works of art stand alone. And the only thing we can do as readers, as critics, is love them. You know, I've always seen music as the highest form of art, but yet I never really prioritize time to sit and listen to Mozart over reading a book. So there is, there's something in reading, something in literature, that even though I've had the sense for a long time that music is the highest form of art and elicits stronger, more immediate reactions from me, it's on a plane of flux that I can't articulate. And so perhaps that's why I continue to run to books, because language contains those reference. She says, the writer conceals, as it were, his interpretation inside literary materials, which feign likenesses on the one hand or elaborately wrought surfaces on the other. The lifelike materials absorb us and draw us into the narrative. The wrought surfaces suspend us over a semi-opaque surface of words and images. One faints, the other dazzles. One of the most beautiful passages in the whole book. And it actually made me think of Proverbs 25 too, which says that it's the glory of God to conceal a thing and the glory of kings 
to seek it out. And I thought we could reformulate it and say, it's the glory of writers to conceal a thing and the glory of readers to seek it out. And furthermore, I as a reader don't only want to seek those concealments out. I also want to experience and observe how it was concealed. Art can render intelligible or at least visible, at least discussable, those wilderness regions which philosophy has abandoned and those hazardous terrains which science's tools do not fit. I mean the rim of knowledge where language falters, and I mean all those areas of human experience, feeling, and thought about which we care so much and know so little. The meaning of all that we see before us, of our love for each other, and the forms of freedom and time, and power, and destiny, and all whereof we imagine. Grace, perfection, beauty, and the passage of all materials to thoughts and of all ideas to form. And now in this last passage from within 10 pages of the end of her text, we get the most brilliant and evocative and substantial four-tiered argument of the entire text, which gets its thrust, of course, from everything that she has loaded for us hitherto. And I would say that for the purposes of this video and for the purposes of reading Living by Fiction by Annie Dillard, this is my biggest takeaway. Art presents an object for study and contemplation. But why should we study and contemplate this object more than any other, more than a pebble or a pelican? That is, why do we seize on the art object, the interpretation of the world, instead of putting that aside and seizing on those things themselves out in the world. In the manner of its representing, in its surface and in its structure, the art object may present, embody, and enact certain additional qualities. And we clearly prize these additional qualities as much as, or even more than, we prize the qualities of pebbles and pelicans, or we would never read or sketch on the beach. Thus, we find in art objects qualities in which the great world and its parts seem often wanting. And finally, in Fiction and the Figures of Life, William Gass says, and I, Annie Dillard, concur, the aim of the artist ought to be to bring into the world objects which do not already exist there, and objects which are especially worthy of love. And so now I'm convinced that one of the biggest draws to books for me, one of the biggest reasons that I read is because there are some qualities that the transaction between reader and writer effects that aren't found in the world out there. What these qualities are, well, we'll continue to talk about that throughout this year.